Hello friends, you are in for a treat today. I am joined by Ashley Breland. Um, she is an incredible uh, professional and expert that my team found through Instagram because of all the incredible work she was doing. Let me read you her bio. Ashley Breland supports people to stand within their own power. Through collaborative conversations, folks are able to become better acquainted with the knowledge and skills of their own lives that are relevant to the concerns, predicaments, and problems at hand. Ashley's social media presence is dedicated to the topic of boundaries. How when using intentional and value-centered boundaries, folks can move into a deeper, stronger relationship with themselves, the people they love, and the things they actually want to do. Oh my gosh, welcome Ashley. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to have you. Um, that's kind of a formal introduction for my listeners about what you do. Um, tell people who you are and how you came into this work. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. So my name is Ashley Breland. I am located on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, what can I share? I'm a clinical social worker by trade. So that is my background. I have been privileged um, to be doing this work uh, in mental health therapy for, I think it's going on almost 11 years now. I'm just the tail end of finishing up my graduate degree in uh, social work, which is a feat in itself um, through COVID, which is probably a whole other conversation. Um, I'm also a mom. I'm a wife. I have a five-year-old son. I have a 19-year-old stepdaughter and I, I own my own private practice here in Saskatoon. And so it's myself. I have um, three a therapist on staff that work part-time and together we are just trying to show up in the therapy space and do things a little bit differently. First of all, I have to just say to people, some people know this about me, others don't. You can hear Ashley's accent um, from Canada um, and she, and I'm originally from the Midwest and it sounds just like how people talk in upper Iowa and Minnesota. Okay. So I hear your voice and it just like <laughs> brings me home. So I love that. Um, well, you can imagine, Ashley, right? You're a therapist yourself, and I work with a lot of people who are in a helping profession um, that having boundaries feels really tricky for them. Mm -hmm. Will you tell me, first of all, like how you got into this particular work of boundaries? I, I always love um, answering this because it's it's not like this big, like romantic story, but a girlfriend of mine, a really close friend of mine, her name is Lisa Gregg. She had um, encouraged me uh, a couple of years ago. I, I was not on social media at all. And uh, Instagram was taking off and that's where all everybody was and everybody continues to be to this day. And um, through some encouragement and, and some thought, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to put myself out there. And I can't even remember what my handle name was at the time. Um, anyway, so I had a very modest following and I just happened to throw a question out because I, I think I remember something around having lots of women following. And it was just a random question around relationship to, to boundaries and it sort of just, it sparked some like, um, conversation I wasn't expecting. And then through that reflection, I was like, oh, I might have something here. And so, um, I took off and kind of dedicated my space to boundaries. But as I always tell people, when this question comes up, looking back, it really makes sense that something like boundaries landed for me. I always can, I, I consider myself like a recovering people pleaser. I am a chronic yes person. Um, you know, I really have worked hard around rejection and disappointment of others. And so of course I would land in the space of boundaries um, looking back, but it certainly wasn't that, you know, romantic story to begin with. It just sort of landed and, and people saw the word and, and we just started having conversations. And now, you know, I've, um, you know, rebranded myself. And so, you know, talking in terms of the boundary therapist and, and have some dedicated conversations almost daily. And, and lots of people come to me uh, to talk about boundaries in my therapy space, which I'm, you know, further, I'm able to have these conversations and then opportunities like this, which are, I'm so grateful for. Oh, me too. Um, I think I can relate. I know so many people listening can relate because a great deal of my audience are helpers and healers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think naturally we're people pleasers. Naturally, yeah. we want to solve problems and help people feel better. Um, what are common questions or discussions you get into around boundaries? Can you give us a couple? Like, some Yeah, you know, something that comes right to mind right away is why are boundaries so hard for me? Mm. Why is it just me? Why is it just me? Mm -hmm. And so lots of conversations around around that. Um, 
another, another thing that probably comes to mind is um, I post often around, you know, boundaries are hard for me because, and a theme that I usually get is I don't want to be mean. I don't want to stir the pot. I don't want to let people down. I don't want to disappoint folks. Mm -hmm. And so that would be sort of the general theme around, um, you know, when we're talking about boundaries is just like, why is it so darn hard for me? And I just don't want to be mean. I don't, Basically, I don't want to go against the conditioning that I have been, you know, that I has been served upon me since the time that I was born, essentially. Okay, so can I take this really granular for a minute? Yeah. When you're working with folks, how do you define boundaries? Because I think that's where we have to start, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. How do you kind of teach or train or orient people to what a boundary is? Well, I think before I answer that, I always like to share with folks that I am not an expert. I don't consider myself an expert in boundaries. I actually consider myself a student of boundaries because me and boundaries are in an active relationship all of the time and it's moving, it's shifting and morphing. So how I would define boundaries six months ago, a year ago is likely different than, than how it's showing up for me. And, and there's two things I like to say when I'm talking about boundaries is that boundaries, well, one definition is that I've come up with is um, boundaries are anything intentionally that you put into place to protect your progress. Mm, so key, like hi highlight. So any boundaries are anything intentionally that you put into place to protect your progress. And I highlight intentional because I think there's a fine line between boundaries and bullying. Uh, when we don't have that spend, we when we're not able to invite that space in for intentional reflection, like intention, reflection, sometimes some reflective, some reflexive work between either ourselves, maybe it's a trusted individual or colleague, a mentor, a supervisor. Um, I think we can get into this territory of um, out, things outside of our values. And so when we really spend time around what is it that I'm actually intending here? What am I intending boundaries to do for me? What is actually happening that I'm thinking that inviting boundaries into my space might be helpful? I think highlighting that keyword is really important and then just protecting our progress because we're all we're all still able to show up. Like I think that's number one thing when I'm talking about people, talking to people in my space is oftentimes because of the things that are happening in and around us, we forget that like, hey, we're still here. We're still showing up mm -hmm. um, amongst all of the storms that have tried to, to come around or that we've we've been um, sitting in. And so um, protecting that progress forward can be something really helpful. And then getting even more granular from that is like boundaries simply are, what am I okay with? What am I not okay with? And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hand talker. So <laughs> this is where my hands are going. But even in office, I'm like, what are we okay with? What are we not okay with? Mm -hmm. If we don't have an understanding of that, it can make the rest of it really, really difficult. I 100% agree. I love that you said I'm in a relationship with boundaries. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think people realize that boundaries are actually somewhat fluid and might change mm -hmm. depending on, you know, you mentioned you have a five-year-old, um, you know, I have a 16 and 18-year-old my capacity probably feels different than your capacity feels for boundaries, right? Because I don't have a little one who's needing me as much. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to give people a lot of space and permission around the fluidity of boundaries as mm -hmm. well. Is that something you find? Oh, sure. And I think because our brains like to just think in absolute, it's either, you know, it's either this or this and, and really pulling people into the gray is where I like to talk about relationship with boundaries because some days, you know, some days boundaries can be and need to be really rigid, right? So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of Instagram therapy. I'm going to, I'm just going to highlight it around just sort of the rigidity of what the definitions are. Like they have to be here. Rigidity is, is not good. And too loose of boundaries is not good. You got to find your way in the middle, but you know, what I've, what boundaries have taught me is that in some instances, rigidity is actually really helpful, right? So if we find that, you know, a trauma response, let's say is oversharing, or, you know, in that sense, learning to be in relationship with boundaries with some rigidity can be really, really helpful. On the other hand, if we're inviting vulnerability in, if we're practicing and sort of experimenting with, with a new kind of relationship with vulnerability, loosening up with boundaries can also be very helpful. Um, and so finding our way inside of, of that as well. But boundaries today can look different tomorrow. And they can look different next week because I think we wake up and we're different versions of ourselves. Like the version that was yesterday is no more. And so boundaries are meant to, to move in and out of that. And so sometimes I'll have folks come in and, you know, we work, 
a lot. I, I invite lots of storytelling into my space and we work in and around like separating ourselves from the problem and, and the individual will leave. And it's like, yeah, this is what I need to do. And then they come back in, let's say a month later, it's like, Ash, like I wasn't able to do, you know what? That's okay. Boundaries are meant to just flow in and out. It doesn't have to be this or that. I don't know if that answers your question. I kind of went on a tangent there. <laughs> it goes back to what you said before about it's intentional, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And intentionality also means welcoming in a little bit of yes. fluidity, a little bit of grayness, right? Yes. Um, and I love too what you're saying, right? That if somebody's in this absolutist space, they might need to lean the other direction. If somebody's in a space where they're wanting vulnerability, they may need to lean another direction. It just kind of depends on yes. what they're needing. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So let me, um, it, here's an interesting thing. I literally, before we hopped on this call, I just got off a consultation call with a whole bunch of professionals that work with kids and families that have experienced trauma. And we were talking about boundaries. So can you, can you, will you, will you coach me through a question that came up today? Sure. Okay. Let's do it. I think this will be super helpful for the audience because it's very practical. So the question that came up is, you know, I'm a professional in my role. And I'm working with a lot of people, families, kids that have experienced pretty significant trauma. Um, how much should I be available outside of office hours for crises? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a very interesting question. My head, you know, immediately like my social work, you know, my identity pulls through and I'm like, okay, well, what kind of systems are set up that, you know, are not set up, not available that um, folks would be clearing this question around um, availability, right? So I want everybody to hear something that Ashley just did, right? So helpful. She just paused, right? And, and, and said, I would just think about like, where did this come from in the system? That mm-hmm. is, how did you say it? Setting up the question about availability. Mm-hmm. 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 Like what's contributing in the system? What systems or lack of systems or resources are actually contributing to this question even being put to the table, which I think is it's such a relevant question in the helping professional and the helping profession, particularly now. Um, I don't know what the climate is where folks where your listeners maybe are from, but I know up here, you know, and I think it's a resounding experience that we just have such a lack of um, support and resources now um, for folks that perhaps are working outside of the public sphere. Or, or mainly in um, or in the private sphere and, and in the public, I think there is there is a pull to um, you know extend themselves um, further. So there's like a there's a couple of things I would I always I always say I always leave with more questions than answers. Um, but the first question that comes to mind is um, um, I oh I don't even know how to pronounce I don't even know how to say this right now. I need to pause. And I do I do often do this is like just taking a second around um it's okay. It's good mom. What's sustainable? I guess what is sustainable? Uh, right? Sustainability and capacity. Right. So I think when we have an individual that is deciding for themselves how much they can extend in terms of after hours help is what is sustainable. Mm-hmm. And do I have a clear understanding of like having that line of like, what is okay. And when I inch towards that line, what is not feeling not okay. Mm-hmm. I think we have a, have to have a really good understanding, a clear picture, which I hope for most of your listeners, they have access to like a clinical supervisor or a mentor, even that they can, um, they can work through this with around. If I am thinking about my relationship or my ability to extend help after hours, what am I okay with? What does that actually look like? And what am I not okay with? Because if we don't really have some active reflexive discussions about that, what we'll start doing is what might actually start happening. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't generalize is um, we might start saying yes to the things that we actually want to stay no to. Mm -hmm. And then sustainability and capacity starts to really be impacted. Um, And then I would also say that our ability to show up for the people that we're supporting also starts to be impacted. Because when we're saying yes to everything and what uh, I'm going to back up a bit, what good is our yes, if we're never able to say no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So having that really reflexive, that opportunity. And if you don't have that opportunity, you know, putting yourself up there to try to engage in that, those conversations, I think are are really going to be able to frame that sustainability and that capacity. And that's all boundaries. Like what we've just like, everything is, that's all boundaries. 
-hmm. everything that I just said in these last couple of statements without actually even just saying the word. Here's what I really appreciate that I hear. And and that is this question about sustainability, because I think as helpers, healers, teachers, doctors, we're asked to be boundaryless. Mm hmm right? To give and give and give to our classroom, to our patients, to our profession, right? To be selfless. Well, we're actually martyred. Like even to extend that people are celebrated and they are put on this pedestal Mm -hmm. for everything that you just shared. Mm -hmm. And so when we're working in boundaries, I think it's very easy then to um, move into this piece of like my worthiness then is yeah. dictated, right? This is this, it's held in the hands of somebody else because literally oftentimes the system, <laughs> whichever system folks come from, I'm a systems gal. This is my social, this is my social work background. So this is how I speak. Um, we'll often put people in that and praise, right? And then others around there go, oh, well, maybe that's what's expected. And then all of a sudden, this is where capacity and sustainability come in and they, they sort of land in that intersection there because it's celebrated. Absolutely. And I think, um, I call it war storytelling, right? It's Mm. like, well, I don't need to eat my entire shift or, um, I went through a surgery. I was standing on my feet for 12 hours and I didn't have, I didn't go to the bathroom the whole time. I stopped drinking two hours prior yeah. um, to doing this rotation mm-hmm. so that I wouldn't have to use the restroom. That's, that's what I hear from a lot of mm-hmm. physicians mm-hmm. The culture yes. of medicine or for my teacher friends, right? Like I'm working until seven o'clock or eight o'clock every night. I'm, you know, responding to kids and families that are, you know, really lacking resources on the weekends. And it does, it kind of gets celebrated as as this incredible part of you being a professional. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm taking though, from what you're saying, which is, is this sustainable? And is this the expectation? So Mm -hmm. are you, would you encourage that professional to go to that mentor or supervisor or, you know, director and say, is this our organizational expectation? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I think policy is, I mean, policy and procedures are the foundation, right? And so really getting a clear understanding of where the, where the, where the agency, the organization, the employer stands in terms of some, I think when we invite that conversation in, I'm, 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 Ideally, I'm hoping that whomever you're having that conversation with is able to sit with you in that moment and really think about, well, in my head goes to like, if I was like the director, let's say it's, well, where is this coming from? Where, where, what question, why is this question coming up? What, what is actually going on for this individual that they're talking about after hour support, weekend support, um, you know, going to the bathroom, (laughs) you know, questions around being able to have, and that's not self-care. That is, that's not self-care. That is just like a human bodily function that needs to be supported. But oftentimes, like you said, in the culture of medicine, it's not. Um, And actually, I have a lot of educators on my caseload. And we also talk about incorporating boundaries in terms of going to the bathroom during the day. Yeah. And so I think really getting a really good picture about, um, and I don't talk about work-life balance. I'm not going to use that word, but integrations. What integrations need to happen? What do I need to add in? I think when we talk about balance, um, if we get this idea of like, just keep doing everything that you're doing, just do it like a little bit more, a little bit better and a little bit more effective, um, which is again, not sustainable. That's nobody can live up to that. That's just like a breeding ground for burnout. However, when we talk about integrations, we can think about what integrations, what needs to be added in for me to be able to show up as my best self in this season that I'm in. And so let's say we, even we have somebody that is has traditionally extended themselves on the weekend. And now they've moved into a season where they're noticing that their capacity and the ability to sustain this, sustain this is just not the same as it was maybe six, seven months ago to a year ago. Well, now if we're having able to have conversations, let's say with a mentor, a, a director around, hey, this is where I'm at right now. And I'm noticing that this sustainability or this is not working for me anymore. Um, and I'm hoping to have a collaborative conversation around how, um, how I can move into a more supportive, integrative um, um, way to show up during my working hours, whatever that may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want I want everybody to hear something really important that Ashley's saying, and that is 
we have this misnomer around work-life balance that if we just become more efficient at what we do, we can <laughs> add more to our list, right? Yes. And you're saying, no, 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 no. Let's no. not add more. Let's figure out how, what we could integrate. And so I think yes. about that teacher that hasn't got to go to the bathroom, right? Yeah. I might, if I use what you just said, um, which was what should be added in so I can show up as my best self. I'm thinking for my teacher friends who don't go to the bathroom all day, I need that. What I need added in is a 15 minute break mm -hmm. for my system. If that's a teacher coming in to just yes. kind of tap out for support or, mm -hmm. you know, um, if that means my, I need to have like a little bit of prep time midday so that I can make sure I get that kind of break for my body. Um, so it's adding something in that will help me show up as my best self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That. And, and exactly what you just mentioned, I've worked with other um, educators too um, around like, what do I need to integrate? Is it, do I need to integrate a conversation? Do I need to integrate um, um, some support and different resources? So let's say something as basic, but as important as going to the washroom during the day, um, you know, I can start to be able to feel better about doing that. And when we're able to call in com community and support, what we recognize is like, oh, okay, well, I can do this. And that means I can show up back to my classroom and I'm actually feeling maybe even a little bit better, maybe even a little bit more in tuned with the educator that I want to be in this space rather than my body just completely fight. I'm, I'm fighting my body basically is the, is the stories that happen over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. How do you have conversations with people, Ashley, when they say, okay, I went, I talked to my mentor, my supervisor director. They said, this isn't the policy. Like I should, but the practice at my organization is such that it's continuing to be boundaryless in everything. Mm -hmm. What, what kind mm -hmm. of conversation or what, how does that conversation look different? Well, I think then it's about how can I sit into this, in the discomfort of this resistance? Cause basically what they're doing is they're resisting. They're starting to take a stand against this, what you've just described as boundaryless, right? So we're not looking to blame or shame anything, but we're looking to notice that this individual, by even just thinking about um, having this conversation around we eliminating weekend access, let's say, is that they're starting to take a stand against this, like this, this theme of, of boundaryless. And sometimes it's lonely. It's a, it's, it's really lonely at the top when you start to do things, but I guarantee you, if you're an, able to bring in intention and you're able to really um, get a clear picture of your values, there are other people. There are other people right around. And this is not about creating mutiny or drama or anything. It's just like, it's like, I bet you there's other folks as well that are contemplating, but not really sure if they're able to ask for that or because this is the way things have, like the most dangerous line ever is like, this is the way things have always been done. You know, it's like, what, what do we have to, how can we, how can we create some change around that? But I think it's about sitting in that discomfort and knowing that if this is something that really is truly knocking at you, this is something that you just can't shut off, you know, like it's just something that you're, you've tried to ignore, but it just seeps, kind of seeps continuing to seep in. Is that sitting that discomfort of being like, no, this is actually not okay for me anymore. I'm just not in the season where I can accept after hours weekend work. And so I got to do some things on my own to be able to shift that. So I want to give you an example of how I, as soon as you said the sitting in discomfort, I was like, oh, I can think of a story right now. Um, so I'm working with a family practitioner and she continues to her front office kind of not with any malice, continues to double book her a patient right before lunch, which means that she's not getting to have her lunch, right? She's not mm -hmm. getting to eat or she's rushing through and having to do, you know, electronic health records and then rush into seeing her mm -hmm. after patients. And, and we talked about exactly what you said, right? Like, what do you need to have happen? And she said, I, I don't mind being double booked at 9am or 3pm, but just like not right before lunch, then I, I'm not going to get a break. And so to your point, and I love, I love it when we can put words with practice, she integrated, right? She said, this mm -hmm. is what I need to have added in, right? Which is you know, a practice. And at first it was exactly what you said. She felt horrible. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm going to be the mean one. Yes. Everybody else is self-sacrificing. Everybody else is, you know, making these, you know, 
permissions. Um, and she said, so at first I felt really mean. And we did. We just said, well, what would it be just like to feel? Like, how would that feel? But I also encouraged her to think about how would it feel to actually get to have your lunch? Oh, exactly. Right? She, yeah. she did it. She went to her front office staff very lovingly and said, I love serving our patients. I love the work that I do. I really can't have you double book me right before lunch anymore. You're welcome to double book me at other times. And at first she said, I could tell that they were just kind of whispering about me. She said, and then pretty soon other family practitioners began saying, yeah, you know, actually this is a bad time for me mm-hmm. to be double booked right before four o'clock because I have little kids that I need to pick up. Mm-hmm. Right. And all of a sudden it created a bit of a cultural shift with wow. this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I love this example of like, you know, integration, what do I need? And then how do I just sit with it feeling a little bit mm-hmm. uncomfortable? Because again, I think as helpers and healers, we just jump into like, I'll just yeah. solve it. I'll yeah. do it. Yeah. Well, and I think another thing that I'm, I'm sort of pulling out of, of this story is something we haven't talked about yet is that boundaries are about guiding our own behavior. Mm-hmm. Boundaries have nothing to do with controlling, guiding the behaviors of anybody else. So if anybody any of your listeners are going to take away anything today from me. It's like boundaries have nothing to do with anybody else. They're about guiding my own behavior. So in this example, a ruler request rarely works. And so if somebody's brand new to boundaries and we're kind of just like teasing out a relationship, sometimes rules and requests of other people can be helpful depending on the relationship. I need you to stop saying this. That's actually, I need you to stop doing this. Yeah, sometimes they work, but for the most part, they actually don't. And it's not, like you said, it's not always just about a malice. Sometimes it's people forget they're human, things happen, right? So in this example, a rule of request would have been going up to the front office and saying, stop booking me. Right. Stop doing that. This is this is okay. not doing this anymore, right? And oh, okay. So we're putting like a lot of power and the front office staff. They are managing all of like the bones of the business. It could be very easy to fall back into those patterns or habits. It could be very easy to forget. Um, You know, there's lots of pressures. But when we come in and and boundaries are about guiding, what I hear from this example is like, this is not okay for me anymore. Like being double booked by noon, that's just not okay for me. So this is what I need to have happen. Mm -hmm. Boundaries are about guiding our own behavior. It is not about rule or requesting somebody else's. And so sometimes when we can even integrate that into our thinking, that's even enough to shift our relationship with sustainability and capacity. Oh my gosh. I, I have to say, I love this so much as a, as a type A person, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. Me too. Right? But I love to control other people's behavior. Yes, of course. That's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> and I'm almost horribly, you know, failing at it constantly. So it's really a matter of reflecting back to like, what can I no longer sustain? Yeah. Yeah. What's not okay for me. And so one of my favorite examples that I give about me is that being moving into private practice. Now you've got emails flowing at you all hours of the day. And when scarcity comes in and tries to really recruit me into its tactics, and it's like, Ash, you got to answer that email. Don't you dare let that email sit. What if they go somewhere else? Ooh, okay. I, I noticed that I was on my phone a lot after hours and on weekends. So I, you know, sat in the discomfort, did some, you know, conversating with, with colleagues and fellow, you know, uh, clinical supervisor that I contract out with and really decided that I just, it just can't be all hours of the day. And it's really okay if folks decide that they waited too long, let's say for an email response, right? Like eight o'clock at night and they couldn't wait till eight o'clock the next morning. Like, it's really okay if they want to go somewhere else. For me, I put in automatic responses. It's been the best boundary I have ever put in around, you can expect a response between this and this time. It goes out to every single person that emails my admin line and it gives me such um, some breath. Mm-hmm. And to, as an aside from that, for anybody else managing this, Gmail is brilliant because you can schedule emails very easily to go out. So let's say I do want to work in the evenings and this is where boundaries can move and be fluid. So I'm not always against evening or weekend work for the most part I am, but when I find myself wanting to be in that space, I actually just schedule for those emails to go out at 8am. So it's like, yep, yes, we're available. Here's the link to book. Boom. That email goes out 8am the next day. 
So then I'm not sitting at the expectation of sitting on my phone at 10 30 at night when, you know, it's like, I just want them to know that. That's right. <laughs> and I love that you're using automation as a boundary. Yes, it, it, oh, for sure. It, it is boundaries. It for sure. It's boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. So I think about like my educator friends who very easily could set up a response that says, if I receive an email from you after Fridays at four, mm -hmm. don't expect a response until Monday or the next. Yes. Thursday, yes. Right? And that's guiding your own behavior. Right. So what happens is, and that's another example I give a lot in my therapy space about emails. I need you to stop emailing me before 9 a.m. I need you to stop that. That's putting a lot of power in somebody else. Mm -hmm. When we go back into ourselves and we make boundaries about guiding our own behavior, it's like, hey, Ash, I just wanted to let you know that any emails, texts, phone calls, I'm actually not going to be responding until 9 a.m. But I just want to give you that heads up. It's an automated message just so everybody knows. But that's where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. That's me. That's you. And if I start to answer emails outside of that, then I only have me to answer for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I only have me to be like, oh, I better check myself. What's actually happening? Because now I move and I haven't gotten to this place quite. I'm, I'm sort of in this new sort of phase of like, nobody can really cross a boundary except yourself. Yes. When we're really into this idea that boundaries about guiding our own behavior, nobody else can actually cross a boundary. But I'm still kind of in the thicket of like figuring out how I want to talk about it and relay those messages. Cause I think it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting space that I haven't been in yet with boundaries. See, yeah. always teaching. Always. Boundaries are always teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So there's another thing that I want to underscore here that I I've heard you say a couple of times. Um, you say when I talk to somebody else about it, or when I run it by somebody else, or when I think about this discomfort out loud or get some support or, so I'm hearing you say it's, really helpful to be in community also. Oh, I community community is how I I'm where I am right now. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be anywhere. I feel very lucky and gra and grateful to have the community. And so that's a community of social workers. That's a community of not social workers. I also have a wonderful community. Like I have a, well, I guess I would be community, like a clinical supervisor that I contract out with, which helps, you know, to, to check off some other pieces. But yes, I think community is really, really helpful, particularly the community that can also call you in. You can be like, you know, Ash, like I'm actually noticing, I'm actually noticing this. So I have a really, one of my best friends over the last 20 years. And she knows if I start saying yes to everything, it's like a red flag and she'll, She'll just send me a message be like, how things are going. I'm noticing this. And I'm like, okay, you know, so it's not only, it's not only important to have community support, um, but I'm really having more active conversations with um, community that is able to also call you in. Isn't that be like, Hey, it's, it's, it's discomforting. Let me tell you, it's discomforting. But when you look at it from the outside looking in, it's some of the, the best growth and evolution work um, mm -hmm. that we can that we can offer ourselves is, is having a community that's not only going to support, but will actually offer those moments to, to call in and to challenge. Uh, you know, it just makes me think of, I have a consultation group who's my community of, of other psychologists. And um, I put out a little uh, text to them and I just said, does anybody have any like tips and tricks for like bags under your eyes? Like, I'm just feeling really tired. And the response very lovingly, very sweetly, but also discomforting as was one of my friends who said, um, maybe supporting every professional's trauma within a 2000 mile radius is creating fatigue for you. And I was like, oh, right. Yes. So There's like, I can't get that at the drugstore. Like, can I, I can't really sort of, <laughs> that's, that's not about right any kind of a cream or makeup <laughs> or whatnot, but to your point, right. Mm. You have those loving professionals who you're in community with, who can just say, Hey, have you thought about it this way? Um, I just think community is so important. I mean, like, that's what I was saying. I was in this consultative call before mm -hmm. we hopped on this call and all of them were struggling with boundaries. And it was so yeah. great to just be together and brainstorm mm -hmm. other ways to think about it with no judgment, with no shame, yeah. you know, other ways to approach it. So I love that. Um, okay. I know we're uh, moving towards. Oh my goodness. It's, it's 40 minutes already. <laughs> I know I could talk about this forever because, and it's <laughs> going to be so life-giving to so many listeners, Ashley. Mm, I hope so. Um, okay. Let me ask you this. What's one thing, I, I just have a few rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. What's one thing that people get wrong about boundaries? That they're to blame for the reason why boundaries are hard. 
I always say to people that boundaries are not hard because there's something not because there's something inherently wrong with you. Boundaries are hard because of what's happened to you. It's, it's not hard because of you. It's hard because of what's happened in and around you. Mm. Yeah. That one always makes me emotional because I just think we're so easy to blame. Yeah. I feel a little bit teary. I have to say. Yeah. Um, Something in like that, that like resonated with my nervous system. Mm. I hope other people hear that. Um, What's one thing right now in your life that's giving you joy? Oh, my five-year-old, my (laughs) five-year-old is, he's very, um, he's in that like sponge brain mode where he just like loves to learn everything and wants to learn and like is really loving school. And he just started hockey and we're a very sports related family, but this was, you know, something I wasn't really quite sure I was going to get on board for it, but it's actually been a, like a really wonderful thing to witness um, and, and hear it from his perspective of going out there and doing hard things and going to school and kindergarten. Yeah. Five-year-olds are amazing. They're something. Yeah. They're, they're a whole lot of this and they're a whole lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last question. Um, it's 11 o'clock at night and you have a food craving. What do you reach for, Ashley? Oh, I've always been, this is so great. My husband and I have these conversations. So he's like a candy, just a candy connoisseur. Just I'm a chocolate. So anything chocolate, I would just, oh man, you know, my favorite, favorite time of year for those that go to Costco, you can get those like big Lindor packages of chocolate. We keep them in the freezer, just a healthy, this is not healthy tip there. Here's a tip. You can put them in the freezer. They taste so good when they're frozen. That's what I would go to. And now that's going on the Costco list actually, dark, as dark we speak. Chocolate or milk chocolate? Are you a dark oh, chocolate? any, any, I love dark chocolate, but truly I, I'm not a super fan of like white chocolate that always, you know, if it's like the last thing that I have to choose for, I'm not going to be like, Oh, I'm not going to eat it. I'm still going to eat it. Um, but dark chocolate is my favorite. So good. And I am with you for those of you, if you've learned nothing else from Ashley and I today, please freeze your chocolate. Oh, it's, it's the, it's, it's the best treat. Yeah. It's the best gift. So forget all <laughs> things about boundaries. Just freeze your chocolate. Thank you. Your for chocolate. <laughs> Ashley, where do people find out more about you? What's the best way to connect with you? Well, you know, it's the Instagram. And so if folks are wanting to uh, connect, it's Ashley, uh, the boundary therapist on Instagram. Yes. So we'll put those links in our show notes for people to go back to and find out more and follow you. I know my team is, we love it. That's how we found you just with all of your incredible content. Thank you so much for putting that work out into the world. You have found a space that creates great meaning and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I hope this was valuable to the listeners. Thank you for dedicating some time here to listen. Absolutely. My pleasure.